Welcome back to Pace Immigration, paceimmigration.com, talking with immigration lawyer Andy Semachuk. Andy, good to see you. Hi, Sean. Nice to see you as well. Let's get right into it. We're talking about permanent residence in Canada for QIT holders. That's the way I pronounce this, this acronym that the uh, Canadian government came up with. Right. We'll get into what QIT is and then why it's important for people that are asking the questions of us. We've got email coming in on what do I do now? So sure. we have QIT is closed. July 15th, 2023 was the last day to apply for a visitor visa under the Canada-Ukraine Authorization for Emergency Travel. Andy, just give us a little bit of backstory on this. Sure. Well, uh, most people know that there's a huge war going on uh, between Russia and Ukraine. Russia tried to invade Ukraine. It's the largest war since World War II in Europe. And uh, some 6 million people were displaced, many of them, well, uh, from Ukraine, basically. Uh, many of them went to Europe, but some came to Canada. And there was a program announced, it's the one you're talking about, the COWET program, under which a Ukrainian who has been displaced was able to come to Canada for a period of up to 10 years as a visitor and the program enabled them to also get a work permit for up to three years and stay in Canada for three years working to offset the trauma of having been displaced uh, because of the war. But uh, many people applied, but you know, Canada had to set a, a time period for when this thing is you know, done. And so they said uh, July 15th, 2023, you either apply by that date or you're not going to be able to come under that program. You can come as a visitor, but not under that program. Right. It says here, no longer accepting applications. Uh, and Canada has said, if you did apply before July 15, 2023, that your application will still be processed uh, because there is a backlog of applications. I know you've written yeah. about this in various places. Uh, just so a note about that. It's expected that uh, something like 90,000 more people will be coming in by March 31st of this year under this program who've been approved. There's a lot of people that have been approved, but only about 90,000 are expected to still arrive under the program, meaning they were approved before July 15th, 2023. I'm sorry, they applied before July 15th, 2023 and have been waiting for approvals or have approvals, but have not come yet to Canada. The deadline is March 31st, and that's why there's an expectation of approximately 90,000 more people coming to Canada under the program. Right. Now, the emails that we've been getting are from people that are either in this program or not in this program and are still looking for help. Um, Canada has announced uh, this family sponsorship route, which kind of replaces QIT in a way. Um, go into this a little bit. There's some important points that people have to consider. Yeah, so the, the, the thing here was the government felt that if you have close family members in Canada and you're a Kowit or Kiewit, whatever way you want to say it, person, <laughs> yeah. a Ukrainian, a Ukrainian national, meaning a citizen of Ukraine that's been displaced or had to leave because of the war, that these citizens or permanent residents in Canada who are your family members should be a way for you to be able to stay in Canada permanently if that's what you're going to want to do. And so they introduced this family-based sponsorship for these Ukrainians who have come to Canada given the, the situation in the war. Right, and there's the important points here. One, you have to be a Ukrainian national. Two, you have to have a, be a family member of a Canadian citizen or permanent resident who's going to sponsor you. And three, this one's key, you must be in Canada when you apply. Talk about that. Well, there is a, a, this is true that you have to, the applicant, the principal applicant has to be in Canada when they're applying under this program. However, a family member, so for example, a father can apply under this program because he's in Canada. Well, it wouldn't be a father because the men are out there fighting. So it's the women who are coming with children, but perhaps a mother may be in Canada uh, and the principal applicant under this program but there may be a child, a uh, child who's uh, perhaps 18 or 19, um, uh, that uh, is overseas and has not come to Canada. 
that that child could also be included in this program, even though that child is not in Canada, because the principal applicant is in Canada and has been approved. Okay, so what we're looking at here, that to answer that email, because we got some emails from people that are saying, look, I applied for the, the CUID, I'm, I'm in Canada, what, what's going to happen now? This is a way for them to basically stay permanently, because they're in the country, they're Ukrainian national, and if they're here with a family member that can sponsor them, they have a route to permanent residency. Yes, it's a phenomenal opportunity for those people who have been displaced, came to Canada, don't know what's going to happen, if they have a family member, they're being offered the chance to stay in Canada permanently. I might just add, this may also uh, be tied into the fact that Ukraine was basically behind the Iron Curtain for 75 years. And many family members uh, were detached uh, behind the Iron Curtain and we could not sponsor them. Canadian Ukrainians could not sponsor them to come to Canada. Uh, for the, that 75 year period of time. And so there's a kind of a, a compensation here now where this program is enabling family members uh, to be able to sponsor these people who have arrived now. Right, okay, so let's carry on because that's the family sponsorship route. That's handy for people that fall into that category and it's relatively straightforward. Barring that, let's say they don't have a family member in Canada that can sponsor right. them or something else. We've got some other options uh, for them here. We'll temper some expectations in that some of these options are harder than others and, and there's no guarantees. But we've got here the federal skilled worker option. Let's talk about it. Yeah. These points that are on this slide pretty much summarize the, the maximum or the best uh, case scenario. If someone's got this set of uh, credentials, they're likely to be accepted and will be able to stay in Canada permanently. Uh, but this is a high bar to entry, 30 years or under, master's degree, one year work experience, excellent English, meaning excellent written speaking, uh, you know, the whole works there. Yeah, French is a phenomenal asset for anybody who uh, speaks French. Uh, it's like a door opener for, for people, uh, you know, if, if you have a French a part to your life. Um, and, you know, if you're working in such fields as IT, engineers, healthcare professionals, you know, uh, it's likely that you would qualify under this program. And bear in mind, maybe you don't, but your spouse may uh, fall under this program. You know, in other words, you don't qualify, but your spouse may. That's another way that you could possibly uh, make it under the federal skilled worker program. And this is also um, kind of related to the Canadian experience class where someone with similar credentials could also make it uh, for permanent residence if they've worked in Canada for at least a year um, and, and uh, has similar uh, qualifying credentials to, to stay in Canada. Okay. So if you think, uh, the people out there, if you think you match some of this stuff, uh, write Andy an email and get the process started or at least start the conversation, see where you fall. Uh, note that the IELTS score, you have to take that test to prove uh, your English skills. And same with French. There is a French test as well that shows your uh, skills. Yeah, there's two, two things under the federal. I realize this is a very, very narrow uh, group. There are not many people who will uh, fit into that group. Sure. There's other ones that we're going to talk about. I'll just say for those who do fit into that group or think they may, there are two steps they have to take. One is get an ILET score, a high ILET score. There's another test you can also take a cow, uh, I forget the name of it, CPIC, as I think uh, acronym for it. Anyway, an English language test, high score, and you need your credentials, your um, educational credentials evaluated by uh, World Educational Services. Uh, those are the first two steps you should take right away if you think you may fit into this category. Okay, let's carry on. Number three, we have another option here, the self-employed option. And like you're saying, a lot of this stuff is narrow, but let's face it, I mean, it's narrow. This yeah. is the way it is. And if you're highly qualified in certain things, then you do have a leg up. That's just the way it is. So here we have the self-employed option. Talk about that. This is a big option, even though it may seem like a small one, because it fits 
uh, all kinds of uh, people in the arts and TV, film, archives, uh, performers, musicians, etc. Um, I'll just talk a little bit about this. Basically, what you have to show is you were able to make a living in one of these categories when you lived in Ukraine and now you're applying to stay in Canada and, and, and live here. So maybe you were in television, maybe you were an actor and you had uh, movies, uh, maybe you performed as a musician in a band or otherwise, but it's a very broad category. It's like if, if I showed you the number of types of people who could apply, it's all about the creative arts, basically. Uh, there's a wide range of people who, who can be uh, approved for permanent residence. The challenge with this program is it takes about three, four years to get approved. So you're sitting in kind of a uh, in limbo waiting for a, a notice that you've been approved under the program. Okay. But if you are in this area, you have a really great chance of, of getting permanent residence. Excellent. Uh, we'll carry on to uh, the next option. Number four, we're looking at humanitarian and compassionate grounds, especially if children are involved. Uh, we we uh, call this H and C grounds a lot. Yes. It comes up a lot. Talk about H and C grounds and people might have a bit of a misunderstanding about how they might qualify. Yeah. Well, uh, basically, it's this is a kind of a catch all ground. If you don't have any other basis, if you've got some um, some reason why you merit uh, staying in Canada, such as uh, um, traumatic experiences, uh, um, for example, war, you, you, your children suffered immensely because of the bombs that were falling, or um, you have some family member who desperately ne needs care, and you're the person who can care for them, and they're in Canada, or if it's not a family member, perhaps someone close to you um, who needs your help. Uh, it's for extraordinary circumstances, not just, uh, oh, you know, uh, we feel sorry for you, so here's a here's a ticket to get it. It's more for an extraordinary situation. But Canada really uh, cares about children, and if children are traumatized or they're going to have a hard time returning to where they came from because of disjointed experiences, and in this case, the war in Ukraine and so on, uh, the best interests of the child uh, govern uh, these kind of cases, and you can get approval for staying in Canada permanently based on the fact that the children will be uh, harmed in some significant way by being forced to return to Ukraine. This matter is uh, quite likely to succeed so long as the war is on. Right. It That's carries good. over slightly into what I've got here on the screen now, the asylum claim, because they kind of go a little bit hand in hand, they at, least, do. at least in people's minds they do. Yeah. Um, so you, we've got the asylum claim. Talk about this a little bit, though, because I know that uh, is this the same as a refugee claim? Because I yes. know we've talked about this before, that war is not necessarily a reason that you can be that you can claim yourself as a refugee and have success that way. That's true. It's better to call this a refugee claim than as an asylum claim, I suppose, but it's the same thing. Okay. Um, it means that you have a well-founded fear uh, of persecution uh, based by where you are from, the government or some related agency of the government that is going to persecute you for the established grounds like re uh, race, religion, uh, political opinion, and so on. Uh, so, for example, in the case of war, if you are just from Ukraine, you're claiming refugee status, that's not likely going to be successful. But if you're from Donbass, which is an area of Ukraine that was occupied by Russia, and you were a resident there, and you went through trauma, and if you go back to Donbass, you're going to end up under Russian rule, that's a problem. You could argue that for that reason, you merit uh, being admitted as an asylum claimant or refugee claimant. The one that I like the most is you're a Ukrainian living in Russia and you come to Canada, you could claim refugee status 
based on the fact that you're likely to be persecuted in Russia, particularly during this time of war. Uh, so that a claim of that nature saying, listen, I can't live a life as a Ukrainian in Russia because they'll persecute me there. And right. I have cases like that. So um, that's a, a, a likely successful case there. Okay, so if you do find yourself in that situation and you have access to the internet, by all means, uh, contact Andy Semichuk. Uh, number six, Andy, this is the last one we'll talk about. Again, this one's got a high bar, uh, right. but, it, but it does present some possibilities, so we thought we'd talk about it. And we've got the startup visa option. The startup visa is not maybe what people might think. It's not like you can come and just um, open up an ice cream shop or, or buy a gas station or something like that. This is a little bit bigger than that. Right. Uh, the, the, the idea behind this option is you are a person with a great idea, uh, some kind of a thing. So uh, think like, uh, I don't know, Steve Wozniak, Apple computer or uh, Sergey Brin, Google. Uh, Sergey Brin is the ideal candidate because he came into the United States, started Google and wow, what an idea. And uh, for that type of a person, uh, the idea is you are going to have a startup, you're going to start up a company to pursue this idea. And the idea is so good that either a angel group that will invest in the idea, some sort of a, a group in Canada that's willing to put money behind you, or if not that, then at least uh, you can um, be brought into an uh, incubator that will prepare a business plan and help you uh, connect with the right people so that you can get this idea going. In those circumstances, uh, you can uh, uh, get permission to uh, come into Canada, well, basically stay in Canada and get permanent residence as a result of this. Um, the most common way this happens now really in Canada is someone has, let's say, $100,000, $200,000 and an idea, and he's mashed up with a group that will help him develop the idea, do a business plan, do a, a, a plan of how we're going to put this idea into reality. Uh, you do that and the group that helps you with this, the incubator or the angel uh, investor group or whatever, uh, venture capitalists, they write a letter saying, yes, this is an idea that's going to work in Canada. You should approve him for permanent residence. We submit that to the government and they're approved and allowed to stay in Canada to do the uh, do the work behind the idea. Right. And I mean, Pace Immigration helps people with this. Uh, so if someone out there does have an innovative idea that maybe they were trying to get off the ground in Ukraine, but of course, events on the ground there preempted that perhaps it could work in Canada, something like that. Yeah. Yeah, okay. that could work. Uh, IT is a, a very popular area where where this works there are guys uh restaurants you know uh especially like chain uh chain restaurants with the uh, foods uh, ethnic foods or you know uh, foods that are not like pizza came to canada because the italians brought pizza to canada right uh, that was an innovative idea uh something like that could work um, you know, but you of, have to, obviously, you have to get uh, investors involved. One thing we should point out, too, uh, Canada's not just doing this out of the good of its heart. We have that line there. It also has to create some jobs. Yes. Uh, there are three reasons why uh, something like this would be approved. One is create jobs. Second is bringing in a lot of money. Uh, for example, we were talking to one uh, potential startup applicant who is going to bring in a medical facility to Canada. In, invest in a medical facility and get it going. For example, an eye clinic, that would be a, a, a suitable sort of case. Or, um, you know, investment or this idea of some brilliant idea that you're bringing in that, that could change things. For I don't know, uh, AI might be an example of a brilliant idea right. that would get you through the door, so to speak. Okay. And also maybe, you know, an electrician to help you with the lights that go out. And down. <laughs> yeah, I, I, I meant to say something. I'll tell you what the story is there. We have this uh, automatic thing that turns the lights off. Yeah. And my friend across the hall here, he's got this duct that he uses that goes up and down like this to keep the thing on. 
I don't have the duck. I have a, I got myself. Hang on a sec. I'll show you. <laughs> what is this? I got a, a, a cat. A, a cat that waves at you. I, maybe you've seen it. But it's um, not doing its job because the waving doesn't doesn't keep the lights. That is, that is a lazy cat, <laughs> not keeping the lights on. Okay, Andy. Uh, kidding aside, uh, we know that there's people out there that are looking for answers and they need help. Yeah. Uh, Andy Samachuk uh, is the guy to do it. You can reach him at a Samachuk at PaceLawFirm.com. If you have any questions about any of this, uh, don't hesitate to write and or if you're watching this on YouTube, to leave something in the comments and we will get back to you, Andy. Thanks for this. We'll see you next time. Loved it. Thanks a lot, Sean. See okay. you next time. Bye-bye.